Welcome back everyone! Boy, that music is so powerful. You'd think I'm gonna turn the world upside down with that kind of intro. <laughs> anyway, this is a <clears throat> serious presentation. I've been doing a lot of work on multiple occasions. I've come up to uh, the aqueduct site and uh, I've established uh, six um, sites from which I've observed a new target that's uh, almost at eye level, just 82 feet differential, it's slightly higher. And uh, before we dive into the data, uh, here's some clips from some of my adventures. The aqueduct is a really awesome site to uh, do these kinds of experiments. Uh, on this particular day, the water was very still. So this is my uh, theodolite, a two arc second theodolite. Um, I'm really pleased with it. I picked it up uh, on sale on Amazon. Uh, somebody returned it brand new. So looking through the telescope, uh, this is the target uh, that I've chosen, this uh, rock outcropping. Um, it's almost at eye level. Um, according to uh, Google Earth, the elevation at the top of that rock is just 82 feet above uh, the observation locations along this uh, walkway here. Um, so it's almost at eye level. So I've done forward and reverse measurements um, at all the sites and gathered a lot of data, which I'll show in uh, just a little bit. So the poppy fields were in bloom and it's just incredible. Um, I've uh, been up here a few times looking at the poppy fields and I love this uh, walk by the aqueduct. It's incredible. So I walked quite a bit and uh, the view is just so exhilarating. I just can't get enough of this wide open area. Just incredible. But uh, let's have a look at the data to see what it says about uh, the radius of the Earth. So here's the data I've gathered, folks, and my calculations. I've calculated an average Earth radius of almost 7,000 miles, okay, with a standard deviation of 185. The data comes from multiple data sets gathered uh, on uh, different days, different temperatures, lots of data. Now, there's the equation that I use right there, and that graphic helps us understand um, what I'm doing. So, I measure the zenith angle with the theodolite, okay? So, that's that yellow dotted line, um, all right? And I rotate that down to the blue line, which is the chord. So, that's the column elevation angle height adjusted. The previous one is the elevation angle measured. Um, and so that elevation angle is referenced relative to the local horizontal. So once I do that, I can bisect that arc segment, two triangles, and uh, some trigonometry. Um, sine of theta equals uh, d over 2 over r. So I rearrange and I derive my equation. Very simple. So quite a large radius. Now here, there is no refraction invoked, okay? Just geometry. And uh, so let's have a look at uh, some uh, refraction articles. So we know there is refraction. And uh, reading the underlined uh, text there, since the line of sight in terrestrial refraction passes near the Earth's surface, the magnitude of refraction depends chiefly on the temperature gradient near the ground, which varies widely. The highlighted text says, as a common approximation, terrestrial refraction is considered as a constant bending of the ray of light or line of sight, in which the ray can be considered as describing a circular path. 
So there is um, refraction and it's bending that line of sight. But which way is it bending? Well, there's a dilemma. Let's look at two possibilities. So this graphic illustrates the two ways of thinking about this and uh, accounting for the measured angle differences. If we believe we live on a globe, all right, um, there's a curvature drop due to uh, the globe of 16 arc minutes and 9 arc seconds. So we come down uh, using those green um, arrows, the vertical arrows. So we come down to 13 arc minutes and 17 arc seconds. But we measured something only 4 arc minutes and 26 arc seconds below the horizontal. So there must be downward refraction bringing that up. Okay, so that's the globe way. Now, if you believe you live on a flat Earth, you uh, come down from 2 arc minutes, 52 arc seconds, where the peak should be relative to our uh, horizontal. Uh, you come down due to upward refraction phenomena. So one model relies on a dropping curvature and downward refraction, and the other one relies just on upward refraction. And as often is the case, the truth is somewhere in between. A side view allows us to understand uh, the two models better. So the flat Earth requires or needs light to curve up, okay? Um, and the globe model requires light to curve down, okay? So the dotted line represents where we observe the peak. So it's down from uh, where the flat Earth would say it should be without refraction. And it's up from where the globe says it should be. All right, so which model is correct? Well, in the inset, I have some... Uh, temperature uh, gradient profiles there and uh, looking closely at what happens close to the ground uh, there's a stronger uh, gradient there on a hotter day and um, yeah that kind of indicates that light really curves up so we don't really know what happens uh, in the volume of air that uh, light propagates through to reach our theodolite. Um, the uh, measured angle theta is a function of many variables, you know? So if we now vary one of those variables, we gain additional insight on what is happening. You see, most of the accumulated curvature in propagation has occurred over a large distance and now we're just moving just a little bit all right so we're not really interested in the absolute measurement now we're kind of interested to see how that variable affects the function this graphic illustrates the benefits of uh, picking a uh, target that is close to eye level to minimize the angle variation just due to uh, geometry change. In the top part, notice the target is higher, and as we move back, there's quite a bit of change in angle observed from the three sites. But in the lower part of the graphic, notice the angle doesn't change much. Now, if we move the target farther out, we further minimize that angle. Now, why do we want to do that? Well, as we minimize the angle variation due to geometry, we begin to expose the angle variation due to uh, the gravitational vector, all right? Some people wonder, how can we measure the gravitational vector with a telescope? Well, it's not just a telescope. It's a telescope and an inclinometer. Inside the, uh, the autolite, there's a highly accurate uh, um, electrolytic inclinometer. All right, so we're balancing, we're leveling the theodolite at the different sites relative to the local gravitational vector. So we'll begin to see in the data this gravitational uh, 
vector variation if we live on a globe? Well, does it show up? Now here's all the data plotted out and wow, look at all that variation. What's going on? Jeez. All right, so different data sets, different uh, taken on different days, times and different temperatures and uh, the blue the top straight blue line that's the globe calculation all right just a differential uh, calculation um, the angle is basically um, increasing from our reference location at site one which i've set that to zero all right so the angle should uh, increase um, between the uh, gravitational vectors when we associate the temperature with the curve, we begin to see a pattern that's quite interesting. Notice the temperatures for each curve starts out at 80, the uh, orange one. Then it goes down 75, 70, 65, 60, 55. Wow! Isn't that incredible? Now let's change the radius of the Earth on the spreadsheet and uh, move that blue line just to uh, curve it. So here we go, 3959. Let's change that to uh, 5000. Boom! The blue line moved. Let's go up to um, 6000. Oh, whoa, look at that. Now let's go higher to 7,000. Boom, wow, almost in between those two curves. 8,000, okay. Let's go up to um, 9,000. And then let's try uh, 10,000. Let's see. Yeah, wow, look at that. And now let's try 12,000. Boom! Look at that. Isn't that crazy? So a relationship we notice is that a lower temperature produces a larger radius. Isn't that incredible? We were supposed to kind of measure... Um, you know, the divergence of the gravitational vector, or the lack thereof. And notice all that variation, which is pretty much due to temperature. That's just incredible. So based on the terrestrial refraction models, I am persuaded that light curves up. So the flat Earth model has a lot more merit. Um, yes, we measure the radius of the Earth. That's not infinite, but refraction is what's causing that. Now, the 12,000 mile radius reminds me of the observations I made from the air in Florida. If you haven't seen that video, you can find it on my channel. Quite amazing views in infrared. Um, we got off uh, a cruise ship and it was really cold, probably around 55 degrees. And curiously, that correlates with the previous charts. And I calculated the radius at 12,180 miles. Isn't that incredible? I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, folks. Our world is incredibly mysterious and if, you, if you've enjoyed this video, um, don't forget to uh, hit the like button and make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. And keep watching. We've done a lot of vertical analysis, but I'm moving more into horizontal analysis. Uh, enjoy this soundtrack and these uh, incredible infrared photos.